No, maybe not. All right. Oh, I keep forgetting how this one goes. You pick a note and I'll go with you. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I think I need a new ukulele. Hey? A poor workman blames his tools. Very good. All right. Hello. We do have some children here this morning. Because Mabel, my baby Mabel, uh, tested positive for COVID, I'm wearing my mask because I'm supposed to do that because I'm a close contact. But once I get up on the stage, I'll take it off. But for now, I don't want to be breathing on you. Have we got any good readers here this morning? Because all my grounds kids are at home. So I should let you know Fred and Rupert, your friends Fred and Rupert, they're at Joey Camp this weekend. So they weren't going to be here anyway. And Harriet's off on her camp. This is her last weekend of her camp. We pick her up on Saturday. And then all the others are staying home because Mabel's sick and they just want to be extra careful. So every week here, our kids read for us this verse. Let's read it together. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And Jesus tells us what we have to do to be part of his kingdom, the kingdom of God. Repent, turn away from our sins, and trust him to believe what he says. Here's something that Jesus says just before he goes back into heaven. Let's read this all together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. All right, good news. So Jesus says, believe my words, and then he says, you'll get power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, when, he, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But how do we get the Holy Spirit to come into our lives? Well, Jesus explains that to us too in this little passage, which we're going to read from Luke chapter 11. So this is a story that happened where Jesus was walking with his friends. Who's going to read for me today? Start over here. Keep going. Hey, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Would you like to read? He said to them, when you pray, say, Father. Hallowed. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. So hallowed is a word that just means be treated with respect. So God, we treat your name with respect. All right. Anyone else want to read? Any other readers here? Do you want to read, Grandma? No, thanks. Oh, okay. Stella, will you read for me? Give us, uh, give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Very good. We've already heard most of those words this morning, haven't we, when we said our Lord's Prayer. This is the prayer Jesus teaches us. And then he teaches us something more about prayer. Uncle Ken? Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Man. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. All right, very good. Over here, Mr. Banks, would you like to read? And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked. And my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Good, and Mrs. Binks? I tell you, even though he will not get, get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give us as much as you need. Okay. So Jesus is saying... That if you want, to, you want some bread from your neighbour, just keep on knocking till they get up out of bed. Is that what he's saying? He is saying that. Yes, pretty much. And he says, but God, God is even better friend than that. Because what do you say? Can we go back to you? So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and, knock and the door will be open to you. Good. 
Was? For everyone who asks, receives. Receive the one who sneaks, finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Okay, so Jesus is saying the importance of persistence, of keeping on trying. Does this work at home when you want something from your mum or dad? Do you keep on asking till you get it? Yeah, sometimes that works. Hey, some of us are well behaved and never nag. But Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, if you want something, ask. And if you're looking for something, keep looking. And if there's a door that's in the way, you keep knocking till that door gets opened. He's talking about being persistent and asking for things, praying for things to God, because God is quick to answer. Because he says, but God is God is better than ordinary people. So here we go back here. Which of you fathers? Fathers. If your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. Good. And? If you then, though you are evil, know how to get good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Very good. All right. So not all mums and dads are, ex are perfect, are they? Hey, your mum and dad might be perfect, but not all mums and dads are perfect. And Jesus says, but even, even mums and dads who aren't perfect know how to give good gifts to their children. But then think about how much better God is than that. He is really, really good. And he is happy to give us anything we ask, as long as it's the right things, but most of all to give us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. This is a promise of Jesus, that God is happy and willing and keen to pour out the Holy Spirit on anyone who asks him. So if you need extra help to be good or to be brave, you can ask God to give you the Holy Spirit. You can say, Lord God, please fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me today to be good, and kind, and brave, and strong. Okay, can we all pray that prayer? I think we can. So very good. Thank you for being part of our family. Thank you for reading our scriptures with us this morning. Uh, that's what we're going to hand over to our Sunday school teachers this morning. Who is our Sunday school teacher this morning? Miss Bev is. So off you go up the back. I think we're having all combined this morning because Talia is not here. So head out to be part of Sunday school if you'd like to. Thank you for being part of our family. And remember, God is keen to give you good things, especially the Holy Spirit. And I hand Thank you. It occurred to me as we we're singing there that we forgot, or I forgot to mention Claire Briers um, has been diagnosed with COVID as well, successful positive for COVID, and she's in Melbourne uh, visiting with friends. So we pray for her. Let's pray for her right now. Father God, right now we pray your blessing upon our friend Claire. Father God, our sister Claire, that you would heal her, that you would keep her safe. Lord God, that you would help her to find a way home or a way to be safe down there in Victoria. Father God, I pray that you would bless her in special ways today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're visiting with us and didn't get a copy of our notes as you came in, please put your hand up and someone will bring you our notes. Uh, it has just inside a summary of where we're heading, what we're talking about this morning, and some passages of Scripture for you to review uh, at home. There's also questions on the back on that Bible passage that the children read for us this morning. We've been working through these last few weeks with these words of Jesus from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the last words of Jesus before he ascended back into heaven. Let's read them together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we've been talking about the power that the Holy Spirit brings on people to be witnesses and what that means, and we talked about that for a few weeks as the gospel is proclaimed in Jerusalem and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, and what it means to have the Holy Spirit come and dwell within people and make them holy. That's what we've been talking about these last few weeks. What is it to be holy in this Pentecostal period? What is holiness? We talked about that. Holiness. 
the word sanctification, the way we become holy. We discussed the idea that holiness is Christ-likeness, becoming like Jesus. And how can we be like Jesus? The way we're separate from the world, in our purity, in our love, and being holy by being filled with the Spirit. That's what we talked about two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about why we should be holy. Why should we be holy? Well, we should be holy because God wants us to be holy. We should be holy because Jesus died to make us holy. We should be holy so that we can be useful to God. We should be holy so that we can be safe, safe in our faith and not falling and drawn away from God, and holy so that we can see the Lord here and now. And on the way out last week, Veronica said to me, you missed one, didn't you, Veronica? Veronica said to me last week, we should be holy because Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So if we want to demonstrate that we love Jesus, then we should follow his teaching. That means being holy. So we should be holy to show that we love Jesus. So we've talked about what holiness is, we've talked about why, and this morning I want to talk about how. How can we be holy? How can we be holy? And this word here this morning is the way we can be holy is through synergy. Have you heard of synergy? (laughs) Good. (laughs) Some said yes, some said no. Synergy is just a word that means cooperating with God. Synergy is where two things come together and work together to make something better. And we are cooperating with God. And so for my, 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 my big quote here this morning from my favorite writer, Samuel Logan Brengel, Brengel puts it like this, how do we cooperate with God? There's a picture of Brengel. Brengel says, God never raises a crop of potatoes or a field of wheat or a bushel of oats without man's help writing in the 1860s, so excuse that he says man when he should say people. He takes men into partnership with him in such matters. He furnishes the sunshine and the air, the rain and the dew, the day and the night, the fruitful seasons, the busy burrowing little earthworms and insects which keep the lungs of the earth open so that it can breathe. He gives life to the seed so that it may grow. Man must prepare the ground, plant the seed, Keep down the weeds and gather in the harvest. Men sometimes think that they're doing it all, but they're quite mistaken in this. Our loving Heavenly Father has been preparing the earth for thousands of years for every potato that grows. And he ceaselessly works by day and by night to help man raise his crops. And so it is in matters that concern our souls. God and man must work together both to save and to sanctify. God never saves a sinner without that sinner's help. And usually the help of some other folk as well, who preach or pray, write or sing or suffer, that he may be saved. Ages before we were born, God provided the means of salvation for all. Angels and prophets spoke God's truth. Jesus came and showed us God's love and died for our sins. The Holy Spirit was given. The blessed Bible was written. And all things were made ready. And now the sinner must hear the truth for himself, must repent, must confess his sins and give them up. Us must ask God for pardon and believe before he can be saved. And for a sinner to expect salvation without doing this would be as big a piece of folly as for a farmer to expect a crop of potatoes without having planted them. And so to get the priceless gift of the Holy Spirit, Brengel says, a clean heart, we must work together with God. On God's side, all things are ready. And he waits and longs to give us the blessing. But before he can do so, we must With his help, get ourselves ready. We must do our part, which is very simple and easily within our power to do. We do our part and God does his. If we just wait for God to make it happen, 
It won't. If we try to be holy in our own strength, we won't. This is a divine partnership. So, what is our part in this process? Firstly, we need to see our need for holiness. We need to see our need for holiness, which is something that you can only do once you are saved, once you are a Christian. So first of all, we need to be properly saved and justified. We understand that we're saved by grace through faith. And in our striving, in our working towards holiness, we're not trying to get to heaven. We've already got the ticket that's going to get us there. We're not trying to get to heaven by being holy. We're trying to be heavenly here and now. We're trying to behave as God's holy people here and now. Not so that we can get to heaven because we're already there because of who Jesus is and what he's done. But we want to be of use here and now. And only a saved person will realize their need for holiness. Only a saved person will realize their need for sanctification, their need for a clean heart. Because an unsaved person thinks themselves quite okay. If they've got hatred for someone else, they think, well, I'm fine as long as I don't go out and kill them. Yes? That's how the world thinks. But in 1 John, we read that anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. You know that no murderer has eternal life in him. An unsaved person might think that as long as they don't act on what's going on in their heart, then they're fine. But Jesus makes the point in the Sermon on the Mount that even looking at someone with lust is committing adultery. Jesus is concerned with what's going on in the heart. The unsaved person is concerned with what they do on the outside. So the first thing then is to be well saved and fully in the light of God's smile so that we can see our need of cleansing. Jesus makes this point many times in his preaching and teaching that there's something within the hearts of men that needs to be fixed. And women, by the way, I'm getting my 1860s style. There's something in the hearts of people that needs to be fixed. And the closer we come to God, the more we realize that we need that heart fixed. We need that whatever it is that's going on within us fixed. Second, we must not try to hide the need, but confess it. There are some diagnostic questions that I use, like when I'm talking to a person, if I'm I'm having a pastoral visit with someone, and question one is, do you know that you're saved? Do you know that you're saved? If your answer is no, then we need to have a different conversation. But if your answer is yes, we can go on the next list of the diagnostic questions. You could say, yes, I've given my life to God. I feel my sins have been forgiven. My life has changed. I've repented. I believe that Jesus has done everything necessary to save me. If that is your answer, then here are a few more questions. Good. But do you know that your heart is clean? Are all the roots of bitterness gone? Do you bear patiently the faults of others? Do you bear meekly and with a forgiving spirit the unkindness of others? Do you love God with all your heart and soul and mind and your neighbor as yourself? Do you feel at all malice and pride and jealousy and envy and evil and filthy desire? Unholy ambition and unbelief and all foolish things have been taken out of your heart. That the Holy Spirit has his own way in you at all times. Holiness has to do with the heart. And as Solomon reminds us, everything flows from the heart. Has your heart been made clean? It is at the heart that Jesus looks And Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. Now, if your heart is not clean, do not hide it or be afraid, but confess your need to your heavenly Father. He already knows the truth. Confess your need for a clean heart. Third step is to believe that the blessing of a clean heart is for you. Not just for special people, not just for holy people, not just for preachers, not just for monks in their monasteries, but for you. 
If you don't believe that your heart can be clean and pure and be kept pure and good all the time, you won't seek for holiness. The enemy will try to discourage you. Satan will come to you and whisper in your ear and say, other people can be holy, but not you. Other people can be good, but not you. But God is no respecter of persons. He makes the sun shine on the good and the evil and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So when the devil comes and whispers in your ear that other people can be holy, but not you, you can say, well, does the Lord make it only sunshine on some and not on all? No, the Lord is good and kind to all his people. The Lord God offers full salvation to all who will take it. Satan will come and try and tell you that you are different, that your sin is so much worse than your neighbor's. Your nature is so evil. Your circumstances are so problematic. But God can change any person, any heart, and he can work through any circumstance. Holiness will make you master of your circumstances instead of their servant. Holiness will make you hot enough to burn through any obstacle because our God is a consuming fire and holiness is God in you. You might have a bad habit like looking at your phone when the preacher is preaching. God can burn that out of you. Although apparently he hasn't heard yet. The Lord God can fix you. Whatever your addiction is, whatever your challenge is, our God is a consuming fire. And he can burn that out of you. Satan might tell you that you have failed so often that God will not bless you with holiness. Don't believe it. God is love. He knows all about your failures and he loves you still and he wants to give you the blessing far more than you want to receive it. Think of Peter, the disciple. He failed so many times. On almost every page as we worked our way through the Gospel of Mark, we saw again and again Peter making mistakes, and doing silly things, and upsetting people, and saying the wrong thing. And at the end of the Easter weekend, as Jesus is being held there and being arrested, Peter curses and denies and swears that he never knew Jesus. An awful failure. But Jesus loved even Peter. And within a few weeks of that epic failure, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and under his preaching, 3,000 people were saved in a single day. Don't tell me you're not good enough or that you have failed too often. Our God is a consuming fire of love. And he can take the most wicked and evil person and reform and change them. To get the blessing of a clean heart, you must resist the devil. and Believe that holiness is possible for you. Fourthly, we need to believe that holiness is for you now. Now, many sinners put off the day of salvation, don't they? You might know people who say, well, I'll wait until the end of my life before I give my life, give my heart to the Lord. Or there are people who know they're doing the wrong thing and need to repent and say, but I'll do it next week. I'll wait a few more months before I give my life to the Lord. In the same way, many saved people put off sanctification. They put off growing in their faith. They put off growing in holiness Some people believe that they'll never be truly holy until they get to heaven. They call it glorification. The idea that they can be wicked and swearing their heads off and be terrible and then wake up in glory and be perfect. I doubt that's going to happen. I'm sure that when we get to heaven, there will still be more work for us all to do as we grow for eternity to be more and more like Jesus. But that can begin here and now. Others think that sanctification is just something that we should look into that one day. One day I'll have enough time. Maybe once I've sorted out this problem or once I've got that under control or when I get a break from this other challenge or maybe once the kids are at school or once the kids leave home 
Or maybe once I've stopped working, I'll be able to devote the time to character development and a holy living. Maybe one day. What's that old ad? Don't say one day. That day will never come. But the Lord tells us that now, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. The writer to the Hebrews says, if you hear his voice calling you today, do not harden your hearts. We are encouraged to seek holiness now. Not wait for some better future time. There is no better future time. There is only now. Now is the time. And finally, our fifth step this morning, go to Jesus and hold nothing back. Give your all to him. Confess your need to him for a clean heart. Acknowledge your faults and failures and your glories and successes. He wants all of you. Give all to him. He wants them all. Everything you give him, he will make holy and pour out his blessings. Give up your rights to every part of life and hold nothing back. Like a beggar living on the street, offered clean clothes instead of rags and a palace instead of a rough blanket, how foolish it would be for that beggar to keep hold of a filthy sock or a pocket full of dirt or to insist on going back to sleep on the concrete now and then. But this is what people who seek the blessing of holiness are like when they refuse to consecrate, when they refuse to give all to God and obey him fully. People can be so stingy in what they're willing to give to God. But God promises that whatever we give him, he will give back to us overwhelmingly, overwhelm us with blessings. Malachi chapter 3 is often used to talk about the importance of tithing and giving financially to the Lord. And yes, that is important. Malachi writes, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. This is God speaking. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be room enough to store it. If you've ever been to one of the big dams, you've ever been to Wyvernhoe, when they open up the floodgates and let the excess water out. Where I grew up in Mugra, Mugra Dam, we'd go whenever it flooded and over the top of the spillway and see that water pouring out. Well, God's dams are much, much bigger than that. He's ready to open those floodgates of blessing to those who are willing to give their all to the Lord. Niagara Falls ain't got nothing on the floodgates of God. He's willing to pour it out and bless us. Everything we give to him, he gives back and back and back and back and back. And so when we give our tithes and our offerings, we're giving to the Lord, representing all that we have and all that we are. Jonathan Edwards, a powerful preacher, wrote this in his diary when he was a student. He wrote, I have this day solemnly renewed my covenant and dedication. I have been before God and I have given myself and all that I am to him, that I am not in any respect my own and can claim no right to myself. This understanding, to this will, to these affections. I have no right to this body, to this tongue, these hands, these feet, no right to these senses. I have given every power to God so that for the future I will claim no right to myself. God used him. This might seem unattractive to you. It might seem like a very dull thing to do, to give yourself to God. I say to you that from the outside, a cathedral window, those stained glass windows, when you look at them from outside, they're dull, they're meaningless. It just looks like black, dark glass. But from within, with the light of heaven streaming through, it is Glorious. Consecration, 
Giving everything to God for service may seem dull enough from the outside, but if you enter into that experience and let the light of the divine love streaming through it, that will glorify your life with a beauty and a blessedness which are heaven's own. In John chapter 4, we read of a man seeking healing for his dying son, coming to Jesus and asking for Jesus to come and heal his son. And Jesus says, go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. He took Jesus at his word. He trusted him. And this is the kind of faith that obeys and trusts and goes. Jesus will not Value. He will not let you down. Everything you give to him, he will give back to you tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, and he will make it holy. Jesus will not fail you if you patiently look to him and hold on to your faith. And as, as the children read to us this morning in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says that God is keener to give us good things than we are to answer the knock of our neighbour at night. And so we should ask, seek and knock. He promises that everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds and everyone who knocks the door will be opened. And our Father in heaven is keen to give his best gifts to those who ask and seek and knock. Jesus says, how much more will your Father in heaven Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Our Father in heaven is ready to do his part, to bless, to pour out, to fill, to sanctify. Are you willing to do your part? I've outlined five steps to holiness, but really there are only two. And you know these steps already if you've been a part of this church for any time at all. Because Jesus says the time is now. The kingdom of God is at hand. He tells us to repent and believe. To repent and believe. Because how we go on in our Christian life is how we begin our Christian life. We come to the cross and we repent and we say, Lord Jesus, Take away my sins and make me clean. And by what you've done on the cross, I trust in what you are, who you are, and what you have done for me. And we are saved. And what that prayer is we pray on day one should be the prayer we pray on day 10,001. Lord God, I repent of my sin. I trust in Jesus to make me good, to make me holy, to forgive me and restore me. So two steps to holiness. Repent and believe. In my experience, the holiest people I've known, and I've known some pretty holy people, none of them thought of themselves as holy. None of them thought of themselves as saints. Because the closer you come to God, the more you realize how messed up you are. And so the journey towards God is one of constantly repenting and believing. Repenting. Believing. Repenting and believing. Are there any questions this morning for those who are visiting with us? I'd like to stop and see if there are questions, if there's anything I've said that's confusing or unclear. Any questions this morning, just put your hand up. I have my phone number there. I have my email address. If you'd like to talk to me about these things, if you've got questions, please bring them to me. My wife has offered that if you want an anonymous question, send it to her and she'll pass it on to me anonymously, okay? So if you're worried about David will know what my questions are, why you'd be worried of that anyway? I'm lovely. I can't imagine anyone out there is scared of me. But if you want to ask an anonymous question, you can send it via someone else. I want to finish this morning by with another story, a story of holiness. And I, I love this story. This is a story of Reinhard Bonnke tells. I'm going to come over here, folks, because I need a bit, bit of space. Reinhard Bonnke is a great evangelist to the African continent. And under his ministry, many, many, many people were saved. He explains holiness like this. There's a man who had a house, 
a lovely house, a beautiful two-story house by the river, a view, everything was lovely and perfect. He'd worked hard on his house, but he had a problem because every day the devil would come. Every day at nightfall the devil would come and break into his house and mess it all up. And every day the man would have to come and clean his house and work and make it good again. And he'd stand against the devil, but the devil would break in every day. One day there was a knock at the door. The man opens the door and there is the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus says, please may I, have, may I come into your house? Oh, of course, Lord Jesus, please come into my house. And he invites the Lord Jesus into his house and takes him upstairs and says, Lord Jesus, here is my best room. It's for you. This is your room. The Lord Jesus says, thank you very much. That night the man is downstairs working away and Jesus is upstairs in his room. There's a scratching at a door and the devil breaks in. And the man spends all night fighting with the devil as the devil runs around smashing things in the house. Eventually, the son comes up and he pushes the devil out the door. The house is a mess. He goes upstairs to Jesus and says, Jesus, didn't you hear me fighting with the devil downstairs? Didn't you hear me fighting with the devil all over the house? And the Lord Jesus says, well, my friend, this is the room you gave me. This is what you asked me to, where you asked me to stay. Oh, I understand, says the man. Please, Lord Jesus, you may have all of the upstairs. All of the upstairs is yours, Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus says, thank you very much. That night the devil comes again and busts in the door. And again, he fights with the man and the man fights with him downstairs. He smashes things and makes a mess and wrecks the place. Eventually the man pushes the devil out in the morning and goes upstairs and says, Lord Jesus, didn't you hear me fighting with the devil downstairs? Didn't you hear me arguing with him and him smashing things? And the Lord Jesus says, my friend, my son, you invited me into your home, but you said I could have the top floor. This is where I have been. Ah, Lord Jesus, the man says, now I understand. Please, Lord Jesus, this is now your house. Everything in this house is yours. I give it all to you. The Lord Jesus says, thank you very much. Well, that night as the man is downstairs washing up after the dinner they've had together, he hears the scratching at the door and he thinks, oh, no, here comes the devil again. He's going to break in and he's going to smash everything. He's going to make a mess. What am I going to do? He hears the devil scratching at the door, but then he hears footsteps. The Lord Jesus comes down the stairs, goes to the front door, opens the door. The devil sees the Lord Jesus and says, Ah, Jesus, wrong house. (laughs) That is a story of consecration, of giving our all to Jesus. When we give it all to Jesus, he makes it holy. Hold nothing back from the Lord Jesus. So to sing this morning, to conclude this morning, we're going to sing, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. And this morning, as we sing this song, you might like to respond to that call to holiness. Again, we have our table here, our altar, where we bring our gifts to the Lord and where we receive from the Lord. So this morning, as we sing, you might like to come forward symbolically and just place your hands on the altar here and say, Lord, I give all that I am to you. Make me holy. And as we sing, I invite you to do that. Or if you'd like to pray, someone will come and pray with you. Just come and stand here at the front. I or someone else will come and pray with you. This is your opportunity to respond to the Lord and give him all that you have and are. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let
more verses, there's plenty of chances to come. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold. Take my intellect and you Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be pray. Father God, I thank you this morning that you are speaking to us, drawing us closer to you. I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit who is here at work doing business with people this morning. Father God, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit more and more. We may be aware of your presence, your urging, what it is you're saying to us. Father God, I thank you for the Lord Jesus and all that he has done for us. And Father, this morning we've come, this morning a number have come, given their all to you in this public way. Father God, I pray that you would bless them in a special way. Whatever they have given to you, you would take, bless, and make holy, and pour out. Father God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit Everything that we give to you, you make holy. I feel the Lord just telling me to be quiet for a minute. Keep trying to pray, but he keeps saying stop. So just wait a minute.
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All that we have given to you today, it is yours. Help us not to take it back. Help us to give you all our house, not just the best room, not just the upstairs but every part. It is yours. The Lord is still doing business with someone. He won't let me finish praying. So if there's someone here this morning who needs to respond and he's waiting on you, this is very awkward for me. I apologize. But <laughs> he's waiting on me. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you are and all that you've done. We worship you, great and high and holy King. You've made everything. Everything belongs to you anyway. So, Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that we would give it all back to you. All those things we think are ours, they're not really. We give it all to you. Precious and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I remind you about who we are and what we're about and invite the worship group to come back to the platform. We want people to meet Jesus. We want people to meet Jesus. And because we want people to meet Jesus, we want to grow and be like him. So that as people encounter us, they get a taste, a touch a smell of what heaven is like. We want to be holy people because we want people to meet Jesus. We want to share Jesus' message of what he has done on the cross because we want people to meet Jesus. We want to love the way Jesus loves. We want to love one another well and deeply and fully because we want people to meet Jesus. So I encourage you this morning to go out, to grow, Share and to love so that people will encounter Jesus. Thank you, Desilla. Thank you. Let's finish off this morning.